get my shoes and out the door. Oh, I'm alive, six, seven, eight, feeling great. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast. I am your co-host today, Dr. Mike Akinfora, and I'm thrilled to have with me on the show, Dr. Belisa Vranich. Dr. Belisa, how are you? Hi, thanks for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Dr. Belisa Vranich is a renowned clinical psychologist, public speaker, and the author of Breathe, Simple Revolutionary 14-Day Program to Improve Your Mental and Physical Health. It's by St. Martin's Press and Hay House. Belisa is also the director of Breathing Science at the Ash Center Comprehensive Medicine in New York City. As founder of the Breathing Class, Dr. Belisa has taught and lectured nationwide on topics related to dysfunctional breathing patterns and stress. Unique in its straightforward approach, the Breathing Class addresses both physical and psychological problems related to oxygenation that is out of balance and teaching people to breathe in an automatically congruous way that maximizes balanced inhales and exhales. Dr. Belisa has taught workshops that cater to a wide audience from the Omega Institute of Holistic Studies in Rhinebeck, New York, to staff and clinicians at the San Diego Marine Base. She regularly works with corporations and hospitals throughout the U.S., including the Young Presidents Organization, Jump Trading, Floortech Inc., UCLA, Sony Music, uh, Cody Inc., Soho House in New York City, and the U.S. Department of Justice. The Breathing Class has been reviewed by a variety of publications, including, O, oh, the Oprah Magazine, the Wall Street Journal, Details Magazine, W Magazine, Men's Journal, Men's Health and Fitness, the New York Observer, Jiu-Jitsu Magazine, and DuJour Magazine. That was a mouthful. <laughs> I am thrilled to have you on the show. I can't wait to dive into your book. But before we do that, Belisa, please tell folks your journey. Oh, well, it's been a uh, long and winding one to get me to be here. I can't say that I went to college saying, hey, I want to teach people how to breathe, or even having as much knowledge in of anatomy that – I found that I've needed. So my background is actually in psychology and specifically in child psychology. So I spent a lot of time doing IQ testing and learning about children and how they learn and how to teach them. So that has helped tremendously in getting me uh, to be able to explain and to be able to teach people how to breathe, believe it or not. But that's where I started out. And then as I, as I, looked at the effect of stress on folks and how badly they were handling their stress and how few tools they had, that sent me over to look at breathing. I noticed that people in general were breathing in a way that didn't really make sense. And most of us breathe in a way, like you mentioned, that's anatomically incongruous, that biomechanically is really unsound, that pretty much just makes no sense given how we're designed and that there's incredibly bad repercussions throughout our bodies and our, our brains and our soul um, when we breathe the wrong way. Um, and that's what brought me to be able to, to teach and to set up the breathing class and now work specifically with teaching people how to breathe. I, I love this. And, and we're going to dive into this. So, Talk to me about breathing. Uh, you know, being from being from the East Coast and living literally ten minutes outside of Manhattan, growing up here, uh, I, and I tell my patients this all the time: we have become over time short, shallow breathers, and we're not breathing exactly properly. So tell me, tell me how this works. Let's start from the beginning. Um, how how is it that your method in, in 14 days is going to improve people's mental and physical health? Well, what happens is the first thing you have to do is understand the way your body is designed to breathe. So there's steps. Um, it's funny because you can tell someone to take a belly breath, and usually, you know, they might try to take a belly breath. And they don't want to because who wants a belly? I mean, we work, you know, really hard to keep the belly uh, you know, in place and not showing. So in general, just saying take a belly breath isn't going to work. 
folks, you need to make sure that people understand or are given the right information and give them a lot of information about anatomy, about why the breath has changed, about the mechanics of breathing. Just simply saying take a belly breath isn't going to work. So the way I started teaching is showing people how our bodies as a machine are meant to work and really in a very straightforward way, you know, here's a piston, here's just all these different parts that should be working together. Now let's take your body and see is it working the way? Are you using it the way it was set up? Plain and simple. So are you using your major breathing muscle, which everyone knows is the diaphragm? Are you using that to breathe? And you wouldn't believe how many people either don't know if they're using their diaphragm or they say they are, but they're absolutely not. So actually recognizing that first is a very important step. And then realizing if you're not using your diaphragm, what muscles are you using and how is that impacting your health? And some of the things that can happen if you're not breathing well is you're going to have trouble going to sleep. You're going to be breathing in a short, shallow way because you have no choice. You might have lower back pain because your diaphragm is attached to your spine. You might have digestive problems because your diaphragm also helps digestion. It helps what's called peristalsis. So all these things that, that most people have at least one or two of or maybe all of are really very intimately tied to the breathing in an anatomical way, not in a woo-woo way. I love, you know, I love my breathing that has to do with, um, with meditation and more things that have to do with energy and chakras and things like, things like that. But where I start from is really anatomy. Are we breathing the right way? So I know that's a long-winded answer to the beginning of your question, but um, that's how we start looking at things as far as the breath. Uh, and, that, and that's perfect because that is exactly what I see in my, in my chiropractic practice. And there are times when I feel that I can adjust a person's spine every day and they're still not going to get the, the, the maximal improvement because their breathing mechanism is so distorted. Yes, yeah, so if you can have a, a great adjustment, yep. um, like you said, and then continue to breathe well, the adjustment's going to stay for a lot longer. Um, yeah, it's going to stick for a lot longer, for sure. For sure. Uh, but most times, most people are not seeing the chiropractor, and they're not, they're, they're not, what's the word, mindful. They're, they're not mindful of their breathing. And this is one of the things that I think that you've done in the book, that it is is a big deal, and and that's what I my you know everybody's going to have an individual experience in reading the book and then applying it, but for me it was mindful of our breathing. So and and that's not that's not woo woo that that was actually what you were exactly talking about that was the the anatomical focus that is that is needed to help you correct these breathing issues. Um, talk to me about why, why, why 14 days? Why can't we correct this in, in you know, one session? <laughs> well, I think 14 days is still pretty challenging, but I, I do recognize that people might want to have it fixed faster, and it's because you actually have to fix it yourself. It can't be like an adjustment. It has to be something that you spend some effort um, doing. And um, you think about it. I mean, I have people that are frustrated. They're saying, I'm on day seven. You know, how is this going to, when is this going to happen? And I say, well, you've been breathing this way probably since you're six or seven years old. Maybe if you're lucky, eight or nine is when your breathing starts to get dysfunctional. So depending on how old you are, you've got a decade of bad habits. Mm-hmm. or maybe two decades of bad habit. So reorganizing your breathing after you've taken millions and millions of breaths that have been, you know, they've gotten me through the day, but they certainly haven't been optimal, is going to take a little while. It's going to take a little while. So it does take at least 14 days. I've had people that it's been much shorter because once you understand what you're doing wrong, that's what's been missing is that in the past you're told just breathe 
or breathe into your diaphragm, which is crazy because you can't breathe into your diaphragm. So there's all this misunderstanding about breathing and respiration. Um, so once you're given the information and not, you know, and actually treated like an intelligent person, here is why this isn't working. Here's what you can do about it. Here are the steps to take. Here are the muscles you were using, and here are the muscles that you should be using. It really is much easier to get things done right. Yeah, it's really, really important. And you wrote that um, oxygen is the sustenance in a way that food can never be. Uh, and and to me, that's that's so simple, but yet it, it's really profound. With energy, we keep thinking about uh, food. But our primary way of, of getting energy is through our breath. So that's why taking the deep breath or doing breathing exercises, people will say, oh, I feel so, you know, I feel like I've got energy. I feel so energetic. Um, I feel like I've, you know, somehow fed myself. And it is. It's sustenance for sure. Absolutely. And, and talk about the flip side of that is when, when people feel crummy. Well, there's something called air hunger. It's interesting as we talk about, oxygen as uh, as sustenance is that the opposite of that is a shallow, inefficient breath that ends up, you know, reper- with the repercussions through your body that are absolutely terrible from, from uh, making your pH either too acidic or too alkaline to affecting your adrenals that are trying to help your system balance itself to just having this sensation, like I said, that's called air hunger, of not being able to take a deep breath in and not knowing why that's going on. Yeah, it's it's fascinating, The um, some of the little side notes. Um, Dr. Arthur Guyton, I mean, this is Guyton we're talking about, folks. This man <laughs> wrote, wrote um, the book, and what he said was proper breathing nourishes the cells of the body with oxygen and optimizes the functioning of the body on all levels. This is huge, huge. And we just, uh, it's something that we don't give one half of 1% of any mindfulness to. So it's no wonder the breathing has 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 morphed into this. So talk to me about what happens when we uh, cut that. Talk to me about some of the symptoms that people will actually feel with poor breathing mechanics. One of my, I don't like to say favorites, but one of my favorites, is um, anxiety. And, you know, especially with women, there are more breathing pattern dysfunctions in women, and there is a higher rate of anxiety disorders in women. So that's not something I think that's happened by chance. The way you breathe is really a mechanism to control your nervous system. So, Lavender candles, great music, um, you know, all kinds of other wonderful things that help you relax are great. But the mechanism, the actual like knobs and levers that your nervous system goes to to see how it should be responding or how your brain and body should be feeling is your breath. So to me, anxiety and stress, how we experience it, how we control it, um, is is directly related to how we're breathing. So if you learn how to breathe to control that, it just makes life so much easier. Absolutely. One of the things that you wrote that I loved was breathing exercises can energize you better than a Red Bull and get you to sleep faster than an Ambien. Neither, uh, neither Red Bull nor, you know, the pharmaceutical that works with Ambien has come out to get me yet. I'm sure they might. But uh, it's true is that we're taking all these things either to wake us up or to put us to bed, to get us to go to sleep. I mean, we spend days, and I know that, you know, I've been, uh, I've done this myself and, you know, try not to, is that getting to sleep is really hard nowadays and waking up and performing the way we want to all day long is really hard. So I don't blame anyone 
for, you know, their double espresso, maybe the second double espresso throughout the day, or having to take a sleep medication because we live in a world where being productive and staying on time is really important. However, um, using the breathing to help with both those things, to wake up and to go to sleep, can be really efficient. It is. Let, let's start, and, and first of all, we're, you're, you're not saying you're going to take away my double espresso. That's correct, right? <laughs> <laughs> no. The, okay, just checking. All right, cool. All right, so let's start at the beginning, and, and this is what I like and found very unique about what you're doing. So you're you're talking about let's let's measure what's going on with you. So you have a scale that that you do, and you look I at do. Um, talk to people about that. Let me stop talking. I'm excited, so I'm talking. Sure. You know, I'm talking with my <laughs> hand. I'm talking with my hands. Nobody can see that. So go go ahead, Melissa. <laughs> So one of the things I looked at is, is why are we not paying attention to the breath? And one of the reasons is that we have this idea that it's just breathe. We have songs that are just breathe. We keep saying, oh, take a deep breath in and exhale and everything should be fine. And the fact is that because we can't measure it unless we're going to a pulmonary clinic and getting spirometry measures done, we just really don't know how we're feeling. You can't see your lungs. You can't see air. So for me, it was important to be able to give folks a grade. And you have to remember, I came from a place where I was doing psychomet psychometric testing. I was doing uh, IQ and personality testing with children. So for me, how do you get someone to care about something? Is that you give them a grade so they can at least realize where they're starting from. And that's where I came up with the BIC. It's the breathing IQ, B-I-Q. So you look at your location of movement and range of movement. Super simple. Where are you breathing from and how much movement is there in that part of your body? And I come up with a grade. Most people um, will fall, and I mean there are, there are some outliers, but most people will fall between a B or a C and an F minus. And they're surprised. Part of them is surprised because, A, they didn't know they could, they could get a grade for breathing. And then also is um, that they realize, you know, I was feeling pretty badly. I sort of knew it was going to be bad. You wouldn't believe how many folks go, yeah, okay, breathing IQ, um, I'm not going to do so well. I know my breathing intuitively. Intuitively, I know something is wrong. And especially women. I mean, we're we're just very much in touch with our bodies and intuition. So the whole idea of is your breathing good? Most people will tell you, I don't think so. I don't know why I don't think so, but I don't think it's that great. So that's where you start out is here is my grade, which resonates with everyone because we get graded on things all the time. But then what's nice is you get exercises to see, hey, you can change this. This isn't a label that you're going to live with forever. Hey, I'm a I'm a D breather. Let's get you to an A. And again, my background in child psych, I would do anything it took to get my kids to learn. I mean, I would sing, I would dance, I would rap. That wasn't pretty. That was ugly, me rapping. Um, we would paint. We would do anything for me to be able to see how they understood a concept and how they learned and how it was interesting and fun and effective to get them to learn. So that's how I came about this method is what is stopping folks from understanding what's going on? What words are stumping people? What concepts are getting in the way of their understanding this? So although I'm sure you'll agree that the book Breathe seems really simple, mm -hmm. I worked really hard at making sure that how I presented it was really simple, so much so that I have people saying, usually when they come to a workshop, is, gosh, this is so simple. How come no one's ever said it this way? Or, you know, I've been to so many doctors. Why didn't anybody just say this? And it's really that I culled down to make sure that it, it felt that way. It felt intuitive. It felt easy. Yeah, the, the the thing that you write here, which is when people usually come to see me, um, 
the, we see a rigid, inflexible thoracic cavity and rib cage plus poor posture, and that also contributes to sluggish breathing. I mean, that's at the, to me, when, when I'm working with somebody and that thoracic cavity, that tells me um, if it's like a brick wall, that there, there's <laughs> really, there, there's some issues here that need to be addressed. So talk to me about, um, I, I, I want people to understand some of the depth and breadth of what you're talking about. So I, I know some of these concepts might seem a little much, but talk to me about like vital capacity and breathing style. I, I just think it's important that people get an idea of what you're sure. talking about. Sure, I'll tell them everything. I really don't mind. I, you know, they don't have to buy the book at all. I will give it away. And I often tell folks, go to your local library. Support your local library by going there. Um, so I'm sure if your library doesn't have a book, you know, let me know. I'll send them one. But um, it's not this to me. My mission really is making sure that people can own their health again and trust their bodies again and get better because we're in such a pickle right now in that we don't know how to feel. We don't know how we, how we feel, what to do about it, who's right, what's good advice, what's not. And a lot, often the answer is, pardon the pun, but it's like right under your nose is that you own your breath. It's yours and you can change it and you can start feeling better fairly quickly if you're motivated. So my mission is more about, Let's give you know everybody their health back because it was taken away somewhere along the way. I'm not going to point fingers, but you can have it back. It's yours. So empowering folks with their own breath. So the main idea is that you should be breathing with the middle part of your body expanding. If you look at any animal on the planet or any child under the age of five, when they breathe, the part of their body where the densest, most oxygen-rich part of their lungs is, which is pretty much um, about two inches above your belly button, that's where the biggest part, not straight up, but if you put your hands on the sides of your body, that's where the biggest part of your lungs are and also around the sides in the back of you. So in the very middle of your body, that's where the best part of your lungs are. However, most of us, breathe with our shoulders and only get to the little bits that are on top. So the way you fix this is that you go back to the way you used to breathe when you were a child, to the way every animal on the planet does, and you make sure that your inhale, your body is expanding, which to some of us, and especially women, the whole idea of expanding your middle just feels terrible because you know, we're, we're judged by our weight, we're judged by how we look, and most of us brace our bellies or we suck it in for decades. So the whole idea of expanding your middle just sounds and feels terrible. However, you only do that for a second until you have to exhale. And when you exhale, you narrow that part of your body, and actually your abs and your core and your pelvic floor get stronger when you breathe this way. So yes, for that split second, you're going to expand your body, but then you're going to spend the entire exhale narrowing your body, using your abdominal muscles, squeezing out all that residual air, which, as you said, the flexibility of your thoracic cavity is so important because inhale means expand and exhale means narrow and contract. I love that. So, you know, Felicia, there, there are folks, um, I think we're up to about 700,000 subscribers, and, and, and folks are sitting out there, and you know what they're thinking? This has got nothing to do with me because I breathe great. They, that's what they're thinking. <laughs> because we all, we look at something, um, we look at things logically, and then we react emotionally. But logically, they're thinking, well, that's, they're, they're thinking, that's my friend uh, Mary. That's my friend Sally. It's not me. So let's do It's definitely one. Bob. That is Bob. Yeah. <laughs> let's do, let's do I, I like how you said this. Let's do a little self-exam. So talk to people 
about some of the postures that affect breathing and, and the jobs that you see that in? Sure. Well, what I'd like for you to do to start getting this together is that if you're inhaling and getting taller and then exhaling and feeling like you're coming down, you're what's called a vertical breather. Mm -hmm. And most of us are vertical breathers, is that we inhale, we sort of look up, you puff up your chest, look out into the distance. You may look a little bit dramatic. Maybe you'll even put your arms out at your side. And that's what you feel like a good breath is, because that's what we're told a good breath is. That's what we see in, in commercials and movies, is that this deep breath is this dramatic upwards motion, and usually a narrowing of the belly, especially with superheroes, is that you see this narrow middle. And the fact is that you need to look at, again, I say it, you need to look at your dog or your cat they are fantastic breathers. They breathe in a way that's anatomically incongruous. And if you watch them lying down, their shoulders aren't moving. Their shoulders are definitely not moving. Find me a dog or a cat that's shoulders move when they breathe. It's just not going to happen. So you really want to mimic them and breathe the way your five-year-old does. So if you look at your five-year-old, they're not breathing in that Superman way up with their shoulders. They're actually still breathing expanding their middle and contracting their middle. And that breath is an efficient breath. It's a breath that helps your spine and your digestion and helps keep you calm. And then life kicks in, a whole bunch of different things happen. Waistbands, uh, sports bras, um, guilt and shame over your belly, sitting a lot at work or at school, uh, maybe getting bruised in the middle or having an accident where something happens where you start guarding that part of your stomach or your sides and, you know, sucking it in. Because we have this idea that sucking it in makes your belly stronger. And actually it doesn't. It actually hurts your digestion. Um, waist trainers right now, the worst things ever. They do not train your waist. Waist trainers push your breath to a place where you are more anxious and really hurt your digestion and your back. If you want a smaller waist, you have to lose weight. Um, maybe you have to do more ab workouts. But waist trainers do not work, and they do terrible things for your nervous system. So um, making sure that you can breathe with that lower body breath is important. And sometimes what will happen, and we can actually do this now, um, if you start from the seated position, because probably – everybody's seated, and I know I am, mm -hmm. is that on the inhale, you should, and again, uh, undo the top buckle in your pants or take your sweatpants and put them underneath the muffin so that you can actually take an inhale, is that on the inhale, you want to let your belly go and come forward slightly, okay? Mm -hmm. And then on the exhale, you want to roll back on your uh, sit bones, tuck your tailbone underneath you, and actually squeeze hard your belly button towards your spine. And if you do yoga, you'll see that this feels familiar. It sort of feels like a cat and cow, but like that seated cat and cow. So on the inhale, you let your belly go. You come forward slightly. You also bump your butt back. It's sort of selfie pose with the butt. And then on the exhale, I want you to squeeze your belly button as close as you can towards your spine, you drop your head a little bit and really narrow your body and exhale out hard. Now, this is a big leap, but that's the way you're supposed to be breathing most of the time in a less exaggerated way, but no shoulders moving. So in general, your shoulders helping you breathe is completely inefficient, and it makes for a lot of um, neck and shoulder pain. So all the neck and shoulder pain that you have, yes, could have been an accident, yes, has to do with posture. You probably see it every day in and out. But if you're using those auxiliary muscles instead of your diaphragm, like we just did sitting down, they're going to be tired and cranky. So when you stand up, it's hardest. You actually need to practice doing that breath, lying down on your back, seated, doing cat and cow. When you stand up, it's the same thing. So don't be frustrated if later on today when you get away from your desk or out of your car, you try to do this breath standing up and it's a little bit more difficult. But it's the same thing is that inhale, you release your belly. And if you're really, really skinny or narrow, you need to push your belly into your hands. 
Most of us just need to release our belly, which feels pretty damn good. So on the inhale, release your belly. You might press it into your hand, and that's an inhale. For a lot of people, that feels like it should be an exhale. It's actually not. That's an inhale because if you put your hands up a little further up from your belly right now, right by your ribs, that's the biggest part of your lungs. So it should make sense. I'm expanding where the biggest part of my lungs are. That makes total sense. Now, on the exhale, you go to skinny. You go to belly button, contracts, gets as close to your spine as you can. You try to narrow your body as much as you can and exhale out hard. That's a really good exhale. Mm. So that's pretty much what you should be striving for. And it takes a minute or two because you've been used to using your shoulders for so long. But what you'll realize as you start breathing this way, number one is you get a little lightheaded because mm. your body's been used to you breathing with your shoulders uh, for a long time, with you taking breaths that are inefficient. So do not do this on the treadmill or while you're operating heavy machinery, is that you'll feel like, oh, number one is I feel a little lightheaded, and then two is that I actually feel more balanced. And one of the reasons you're not imagining the feeling more balanced is when you breathe with the lower part of your body, with your diaphragm expanding and contracting your middle, your center of gravity is actually lower. So that feeling of being unstable or feeling like you're off balance may be that psychologically you're feeling that way. You're rushed, you're stressed out, you're feeling unbalanced. But it's also the fact that when you breathe vertically up and down with your neck and shoulders, you are off balance. You're putting yourself off balance. So when you start breathing like that with your with your belly, inhaling and exhaling, expanding and contracting, enjoy the feeling of feeling more balanced because physically you actually are. I love that. that that's brilliant. Um, talk to us about uh, the difference between, say, like a paradoxical breather or a gasper and a breath holder. W- what happens with that? What's sure. That? Oh, those are my favorites. So once you figure out if you're a vertical or horizontal breather, or most people are vertical with a little bit of mix, then you can start pushing yourself not to be vertical and to be more horizontal. And again, ladies, I'm going to remind you that when you do these exercises, they are fantastic ab exercises. Your abs will actually get stronger, and your pelvic floor will get stronger. So the breakdown of different types of breathers is that you can be one of the worst ones, and and it's fairly common, it's called paradoxical. And that actually means that on the inhale, you puff up your chest and you narrow your belly. Not good. So usually you can tell a paradoxical breather because I tell you to inhale, expand your body, exhale, narrow, and your whole body goes, what are you doing? That feels completely opposite of what I want to do. So if you're listening right now and you're thinking, hmm, this is so strange, this is the opposite of what I want to do, well, you're a paradoxical breather, which means that you're running on fumes, you're probably exhausted, and that changing your breath to be horizontal is actually going to be life-changing for you because you're breathing without going into too much detail because it's hard to show you without a um, an image of a diaphragm is that you're breathing the exact opposite of the way your body wants to breathe so think about the energy that you've been spending on battling with your body where the inhale is a narrow when your body wants to take in air through the best part of the lungs you've been squeezing it And now when it actually wants to get rid of air, you're relaxing it. So my paradoxical breathers, relearning how to breathe just really is completely life-changing. I have no other word for it. Um, Then you have breath holders. And a lot of us, especially women, are breath holders. And breath holders are stressed out. So they're just, think about it. Your, Your natural reaction to something that's startling or stress is holding your breath. Well, breath holders will do this all day long, all the time, as if they're holding their breath underwater, but they're above on land. So breath holders, usually you'll find that they'll yawn or sigh a lot. And that's their body trying to catch up with sort of all the uh, disturbances and all the um, erratic things that are going inside of your body because you're holding your breath all the time. So think about it. I actually 
was uh, talking this morning to a friend about a post I put up on my Facebook page that said that, you know, holding your breath, because I have a lot of people who like holding their breath to see how long they can get to. Yeah, that can be fun and it's interesting and there, there are times that can be useful, but breathing continuously is actually what you want to be doing. So with breath holders, making sure that their hips are moving on the inhale and the exhale. The inhale, you're bumping your butt back. It's selfie butt. Um, on the exhale, you're tucking your tailbone underneath you. So you're getting flat butt, butt goes underneath your body, and you're squeezing your body. So making sure that your hips are moving will keep you breathing throughout the day. And that takes a little while to get used to because that stress response of holding your breath is something that's pretty deep inside our brains. And then folks who hover. So folks who hover, inhale tiny sips and exhale tiny sips. And usually this will be the person who tiptoes a lot. So again, I don't want to make huge generalizations in personality types, but your folks who hover have had to tiptoe. And with their breath, they tiptoe. They don't feel like they deserve to take a deep breath or want to make noise to exhale. So watch yourself. See, are you taking a big breath? Are you expanding your body? Or are you just trying to be quiet and sip in a little bit of air here and there? That being said, the folks who hover the most as far as sports, because I work with a lot of people in in sports, are golfers. Golfers are terrible, terrible breathers. They will inhale a tiny bit and exhale a tiny bit and then wonder, you know, why uh, why they don't feel so great, um, why they aren't doing as well as they'd like to. But golfers hover a lot. And uh, the other sport is Pilates. Pilates folks, um, even though Joseph Pilates was a big believer of the breath, tend to exhale really well, but not really inhale in an expansive way. <laughs> I, I, before we got on the show, folks, I was I was – Helen Belisa that I actually read the book. I didn't see that. So that is actually, that's mind blowing to me. Very cool. Very cool. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Put that one in the book. Um, I don't want to give away the whole book. And I really, folks, you've got to read this. This amazing book. Um, how, how How do you relearn to breathe? So the understanding, this is important, the understanding of where when things went awry is important. And as human beings, we need to understand the why. Yes. You can't just tell us what to do. We won't do it. We need to understand how did I get here, what did I do, and really identify with the process. Because if not, it's just another piece of health information that's getting thrown at us like, you know, all the health information, all those things we're supposed to be doing every single day. So it's really about, very personal, is about looking at your own breath and saying, huh, yes, like I remember getting poked in the belly when I was eight by someone and being called fatty. And I remember sucking in my gut since then. And I remember sucking in my gut and good grief, actually, I've been sucking in my gut since I was eight years old. And wow, no wonder I feel like I have this sensation of not getting enough air. Wow, there's a name to that. It's called air hunger. So it's really about looking at the process and looking at your own experience of when did I stop breathing well. I had, um, I was working with someone once and she said, I've been uh, sucking in my gut. I got a job as a, uh, an airline attendant. I'm sorry, I probably don't have the most updated PC word, but she said our outfits this time, this was about 20, 20, 30 years ago, were so tiny and so restrictive, and we had to be able to fit through the aisles that I remember I started holding my breath just to try to be narrower for my job. And, you know, she found, she looked and found the place where she had changed her breath that she could remember. So looking to see where you changed your breath and why you did it is important in sort of dismantling your own bad breathing habits. And then is understanding the diaphragm because we don't understand it. I mean, our our knowledge of human anatomy is so poor, and I'm sure you see this all the time, 
but people don't know what muscles they have, where they are, what they do. We need to, you know, own our bodies more. It's, it's such a perfect, beautiful machine if you don't mess it up. And the diaphragm is something that people don't understand. They think about, oh, it's a plunger, which is the worst analogy ever. <laughs> worst analogy. It's not a plunger. <laughs> or they say, yeah, it's such an ugly one, too. So, and they say, oh, you know, you breathe into your diaphragm. If I hear one more person talk about breathing into the diaphragm, you can't breathe into your diaphragm. It's a, it's a, you know, flat or domish e uh, muscle that's like, I, I say it like it is. It's like a Frisbee. Um, I know that uh, the last workshop I gave, I said it's a, uh, like a flank steak the size of a Frisbee <laughs> because it's big, it's muscular. So, okay, I, I do a lot of food analogies, usually because I'm hungry. So I reference, you know, steaks and pizzas and things like that. But if you think about this enormous muscle, the size of a Frisbee that's a flank steak, well, damn, that is some powerful thing right there. And are you using it? Yeah, well, let's look at your grade. Let's look at your bit grade. You got a D? Well, that's pretty much your no. You're not using that big, huge muscle that's right underneath your heart and right above your second brain, your gut, your intestines. And when you start using it, not only do you take better breaths because you're using bigger part of your lungs, you know, you're massaging your heart from the bottom, you're massaging your intestines from the top, you're letting your vagus nerve know that you like to calm down, lower your heart rate, lower your blood pressure, lower your cortisol, all kinds of good things happen. So really not treating people like they're stupid and letting them have as much information anatomically and, and psychologically about the breath helps them be able to change things. Well, I can – this has been amazing. I could talk to you all day about this. I've gotten so much out of this, and I'm really grateful for you taking the time, but I'm also cognizant of your time. Talk to people about where they can find you in the world, Belisa. Sure. Um, unfortunately, I spend way too much time on Instagram, which everybody <laughs> spends way too much on Instagram. But at least you know exactly what airport I'm in, and you know what I'm uh, what I'm eating at every airport. <laughs> um, so my Instagram is Dr. Belisa D R B E L I S A. Um, the Facebook page is The Breathing Class by Dr. Belisa. The website is The Breathing Class. The book is Breathe. I'm obviously not very creative when it comes to names. Um, and what I do is I travel and teach. So, for instance, uh, I'm teaching a group of CrossFitters. I'm going over and teaching at the VA in Virginia, in uh, Nashville. I'm going to Chicago and doing a group of people there. So if you'd like the class, it's really about – uh, reaching out, Dr. Belisa, at the breathing class and seeing if you can put together a group of folks and, and I travel um, all over the United States and, and I teach. But um, you can also find a lot of information on my website. Um, you don't need to see me specifically. Um, I do podcasts um, whenever I'm invited because I love being able to give out information in this way. And like I said, if you would like to get the book, that's great. It's St. Martin's Press or Hay House if you're in the U.K. Um, but if not, please support your local libraries. I love my local library. And um, and I'm very good at answering questions. If you email me, if you drop me a line um, on the website or on Instagram, I definitely will answer as quickly as I can. Um, just a selfish question on my part. When will you be teaching your class in New York City again? New York City, um, I don't have a class scheduled right now, but that doesn't mean that I won't next week. Okay. It's more about uh, when I happen to land there and organizing it. Gotcha. So I don't have one set up for right now. I'm doing a lot of teacher training right now. Mm. So um, I just found that a lot of people wanted more information than just the workshop. They yep. kept saying, can, do you do certification? Do you do uh, an intensive? So right now, if it's something that interests you, I get people who are either in health in some way yep. or are looking to go back to work and want to teach something 
or just want a really intensive class. They don't plan on teaching, but they want to take the intensive class. So I'm doing a lot of teacher training. There is one coming up in September, Mm -hmm. and you can always do it remotely. I have a fantastic senior assistant and I that do teacher training online together with people one-on-one, and that's great fun, and you learn a lot for sure. Well, thanks so much for sharing um, your 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 ideas and your book, and really what what I see is a, an important mission with with our audience today. I really appreciate you taking the time out, um, folks. If you like what you heard today, please leave a review on iTunes. It helps us to help others because then they find us a lot easier. All of Belisa's information will be in the show notes um you can get the book please get the book it's an amazing book um those uh if you don't get it in the library you can get it on amazon uh and we'll have the link in the show notes as well so uh it was great speaking with you um i'm sure we'll run into each other my wife wanted to take your last class when you're in manhattan we just had previous commitments so next time you're here i'm sure we'll both be in class So thanks again, and folks, we'll talk to you soon. Have a great day. Ciao. One, two, three, four, get my shoes and out the door. Five, I'm alive, six, seven, eight.